Welcome. I'm Jeff Yi, author of the Particles of the Universe book series. And this is the first of a, what I hope will be a series of videos that both summarize and also supplement what's in the books. And so for this first introduction video, I wanted to start with the reason why I wrote the books in the first place. And so it really begins with questions, questions in science that bothered me for a long time that I wanted to seek answers to, and hopefully you do too. So let's begin. This is an introduction to the particles of the universe. And this video is the first of nine different videos that will summarize the Particles of the Universe books and the forces and matter and light that make up the universe. The introduction really starts with questions in science. And these are questions that really still don't have satisfactory answers. And I'm going to run through about five of these questions for you. The first one is a simplification of matter. You know, about a century ago, all of matter, trees and clouds and water and other things that you see here pictured on the left, were simplified to elements, 118 different elements in the periodic table of elements, which are formed from atoms. And those elements are really nothing more than just a combination of protons. One proton in an uh, atomic nucleus is hydrogen, two is helium, and so forth. And so all of matter really can be simplified to the number of protons in an atom. But here's the crazy thing about it. Smash those protons together to see what's inside of a proton, and you end up with dozens and dozens of subatomic particles that appear now in particle accelerators. And on the right here you see the standard model, which is the, the model for subatomic particles. There actually is a lot more than that. There's 17 that you see here on the right, but these are the 17 elementary ones, and there's a lot more that are also found that are made up as a combination of these. And so the question becomes, why is nature simplified as we go from matter down to atoms but as we go deeper from an atom to something smaller, it's complex again. Why? And here's another question that's at least bugged me for a long time, which is the annihilation of an electron. An electron and a positron are attracted to each other. One has a negative charge and the other has a positive charge. And we don't see a lot of positrons in nature because of this, right? An electron collides with a positron, they annihilate, and poof, they disappear. But here's a proton, the exact same charge as the positron, and the electron doesn't annihilate with it. It is also attracted to a proton, but now it does something different. Right? It takes a path around a proton. Why? Two particles identical charge, and the electron does two very different things. Now let's take a look at electron orbit again, but to compare it to a satellite that goes around Earth. Because when a sat satellite orbits around Earth, it can change its distance based on a change in energy. Let's just say the satellite is about a thousand miles from the surface of the Earth. Now it can increase or it can decrease that distance by firing its forward or rear rockets. And now it's just changed its orbital. And so in this case, you know, maybe the satellite goes from 1,000 miles up to 1,001 miles or 1,002 just by changing energy. But an electron in an atomic nucleus does not do the same thing as it orbits a proton. It has what's called quantum jumps. And in this illustration, it just jumped from the first orbital to the second orbital. It would be the equivalent of that satellite that's going around Earth going from 1,000 miles, but it can't go to 1,001. It can't even go to 2,000 miles. It can jump to 4,000 miles. And again, why? Why does it take those quantum jumps? And here's another crazy one about the electron. The electron is known to have a probability function. Right? So even though it was 
modeled as you know, something that can orbit around a proton. It's actually not the case. It bounces around, it jumps, and it can be almost anywhere. It's at least described this way, that it can be anywhere and everywhere until we look for it. And that's what's known as this probability function. And in this case, there's only one proton and one electron, and that's hydrogen. And there's an average, a mean radius, what's called the Bohr radius. And so it has a probability you know, of being in a lot of different places, but its most probable location is the Bohr radius, but it's never guaranteed to be there. And that's very different than a satellite rotating around the Earth or, or any of us as we're walking down the street. We don't have probability functions. We have a known and fixed location as we move, but yet the subatomic world doesn't. And it only gets more complicated as more protons are added to the atomic nucleus. Here you see five protons, which is boron, and it's the first atomic element now that has a different shape, the p orbital. And there's different shapes, s, you know, p, you see they're in yellow, d in blue, and f in green at the bottom is the most complicated one. And all of these are based on different shapes because of the number of protons in the atomic nucleus. Again, why? Why does the electron have a probable location? And more importantly, why does it take strange different paths around the proton? And I'll do one last one here, which is remember that electron that annihilates with the positron that we talked about earlier? Well, it seems to be gone, but here's the strange thing about it. Matter can be created from nothing. Now this doesn't happen, of course, for anything larger than the atom, but for subatomic particles, a gamma ray can hit nothing, absolutely nothing in empty space, and all of a sudden, an electron and positron appear. This is a process known as pair production. Why? Well, to some that are probably just hearing about this for the first time, you would think, all right, maybe it's annihilated, Maybe they are still there and we don't see them and the gamma ray separates them. And that would be a plausible explanation, but it's not the answer today. And this is one of the reasons why. Matter, which is what the particles are, are governed by the equation on the left, E equals mc squared. The energy of light, which is that photon or gamma ray, is governed by a different equation. And these are two different branches of physics and these two energy values, although this is simple equations, cannot be tied together. We don't know and understand how energy can be transferred from mass to light or back to matter again. And there's two things I think that are important about this page you're looking at. One is how simple these relationships are. Now, this is an equation the one on the left that simply just says energy is mass times the wave speed squared. So mass times wave speed times wave speed, which is the speed of light. And on the right, again, very simple relationship expressed algebraically, which is the energy of light, or photon, is the Planck constant times the wave frequency. All right, so the first important thing to note here is how simple the universe is in describing the energy of matter and the energy of light. The second thing here is a big hint, which is notice that there's a wave speed on the left equation and a wave frequency on the right equation. That itself is a huge hint of tying these two equations together, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's get a little bit deeper. Because as we try to find the root of energy, you know, why is, what is the energy of matter? What is the energy of light or photons? And how can it be tied together? This is one of the equations that governs it. It's a horrendous looking equation. It's the standard model equation. And it has 19 adjustable parameters. And again, the question, just like when we talked about particles is, is the universe really this complex as we dig deeper and deeper? That 
we went from a simple equation, a simple algebraic equation, with a couple of different unknowns or variables now to something that has 19 and it's just a complicated mess of an equation. And I think for a lot of people, my answer is, right, who cares? Now, this is the equation for subatomic particles. Who really needs to know and understand the energy of subatomic particles? But that question is incredibly important for our future of energy, and I'll explain why. If we go back to those two equations I showed you earlier, science can be used for practical applications. Right? These equations led to an understanding of energy sources, the energy of matter. Matter can be split, and we can create nuclear energy out of that. On the right, you see equals HF. And that's not only the equation that's really helpful for those of us in the electronics industry, you know, for, for example, the energy that it takes to do a radio wave that makes your cell phone work. But it's also important to know and understand how much energy is coming from the sun that can be absorbed and created to electrical energy. So it led to solar. So again, the important thing here is understanding energy, modeling it with equations, allows us to develop practical applications. But my question is this, if we don't understand the root fundamental of energy, and we're using an equation like I showed you earlier with a standard model, how can we realistically build new practical applications based on that? And so here's the premise. If we can truly understand the fundamentals of energy, something different, something where we have not looked before so that we can understand how matter and light get to the root of something else that is energy, well, then and only then do I believe that we will have the next advancement in energy and build new energy products based on this science. And really that's the reason for the book and a call to action which I wrote in the Particles of the Universe. So to understand energy, we need to think about it differently. We need to think about the particles of the universe in a very different way. And that was the book. And to think differently, let's use four things here. Energy, particles, photons, and forces. Think about energy as waves that travel the universe. Particles as standing waves photons as transverse waves, and forces as the motion of those particles to minimize their wave amplitude. Right, and at this point, don't worry about understanding standing waves and transverse waves. We're going to go over that in the next video. But this is thinking differently. And then we think differently, we'll be able to answer the questions that I raised earlier, plus a lot more. But most importantly, I think it bridges the two branches of classical and quantum physics together as we try to look for the root of all energy to be able to build practical applications that will solve our energy needs. Thinking differently about the universe and a new theory does have a significant burden of proof because it's not just about logically explaining particles and forces and photons, it's also about mathematically deriving existing equations and their constants, and also matching uh, new equations against existing data, and hopefully formulating some new experiments as proof. And all of that will be shown and achieved in the upcoming videos. It's already available today. If you get impatient, you're welcome to uh, go through the book where all of this is already described in detail, the particles of the universe too. But everything, before we get into forces and photons and all this other stuff, everything requires energy. And so we need a new definition of energy. And more importantly, how energy can transform from one form to the next. And so that'll be the starting point for video number two. So that, this concludes the intro video. And I hope to get video number two and the ones that follow out on a weekly basis. So thanks for your time. Look forward to having you join for the next video.